Hi there. We're busy with the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, we're busy with the intro of the Sermon on the Mount. Because the Sermon on the Mount is recorded for us over three chapters in our Bible. In Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And so if we had to spend time on that whole sermon, we would probably run a series for months. So we're actually busy with the intro. An amazing intro. And in this intro... Jesus gives us eight keys or eight truths, eight attitudes. That's why these eight attitudes are also called the B attitudes. These are the attitudes that God wants us to have. It's the kind of person that God wants us to be. He says, I want you to, to develop these in your life. And so we don't just suddenly get them when we get saved. I wish it was the case but we develop them probably for the rest of our lives. So last week we looked at the first four, and I want to just recap very quickly, and we're going to start reading from Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, and I'll just recap the first four B attitudes just very briefly. Let's start off with verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and that's why it's called the Sermon on the Mount, because that's where Jesus taught them. And he sat down, and his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, and he said, now this is where it starts, listen to this in verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now to be poor in spirit doesn't mean that you, you poor materially. Or that you're living in poverty. Jesus isn't saying, blessed are those who live in poverty. No, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, blessed are those who recognize their spiritual poverty. Who acknowledge that they need God in their lives. And so this is the first thing that Jesus says. He says, this thing is probably more important than anything else. You've got to get to a place in your life where you recognize you need God. And that's why he says, blessed are those who are poor in spirit. They, they recognize their spiritual poverty. And then he has the second one. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now the mourning he's referring to is not a mourning over some loss, where you've lost a loved one or something like that. It's, it's very different. It's a mourning over, over sin, over wickedness in our lives where we have a broken heart and where we feel terrible about the life we've lived or the deeds we've committed. And so it's a deep sorrow that leads to repentance. You see, it's one thing to recognize your spiritual poverty. In other words, your need for God. But it's another thing to weep over that, to have a really broken heart. It's one thing to declare that you're far from God but it's another thing to despair that you far from him. All right, let's go on to number three. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Now, meekness is not weakness. Remember we said meekness is strength under control. Remember the picture of, of the racehorse, the stallion, tremendous strength, tremendous power and, and speed under control. And so meekness is strength under control, but it's also humility. What's the opposite of humility? It's pride. And the Bible has so much to say about these two attitudes, a prideful attitude, but, but a, a humble attitude. God blesses the one and he hates the other one. And so humility is, is key. And that's why scripture says, blessed are the meek, or you could substitute that and say, blessed are the humble. Now, let's move on to number four, and this is a big one. We spent a little bit of time on this one last week. Verse six says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. What does it mean to hunger and thirst for righteousness? It simply means that you have a strong desire for more of the Lord and to be more like the Lord. That there's something within you and me that just continually wants 
more of God. We just, we just want more of God. And we want to spend time in His presence. And we want to spend time in praise and worship. And we just somehow want to spend time in His Word. There's such a desire for more of the Lord. But there's also a desire to be more like the Lord. And so one of, one of my goals, one of my daily goals, let me just share with you a little bit. I, I say to myself, Leonard, just try and be a little bit more like Jesus today and a little bit less like yourself. Because you see, Leonard is not really cool at all. But Jesus is super cool. And so my goal is to be a little bit more like him every single day and a little bit less like myself. I, I want to make sure that, that my speech is right, my walk is right, my thoughts are right before the Lord. I want to be a little bit more like Him. And so I think that covers the first four Beatitudes. I'll put them on the screen for you quickly. The first one is, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's recognize your need for God. And then secondly, blessed are those who mourn. It's demonstrate a repentant heart or a broken heart. And then blessed are the meek. That's display a, a humble spirit or gentle spirit. And then blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's desiring more of God where we just, we want more. Now let's look at the next four. And I want to encourage you quickly today just to pick one. We're going to look at four of them. But I want you just to pick one. And I actually want to ask you to ask God, Lord, which one is for me? Can we pause just for a moment and pray that? Father, we're going to go through these four right now. But there's one that I need to apply in my life more than the others. I probably need all of them. I definitely do. But there's one I need to apply more. I pray that you highlight it for me today. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's move on then to number five. Here's the fifth one. So mercy. You know, the Bible says in verse 7, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. You know what it's saying is, if you will sow mercy, you are going to reap mercy. If you sow it, you will reap it. Now, to understand mercy, we've also got to understand justice. What is mercy and what is, what is justice? Justice is when we get what we deserve, when we've messed up. Let's say we've broken the law, something like that, and we get what we deserve. That's justice. Mercy is when we don't get what we deserve. And so let's say, let's say you're driving along maybe a little bit faster than the speed limit. The next moment, traffic officer jumps out, puts his hand up. And that's generally where for most of us, the moment he jumps out from behind that bush, our hearts almost want to jump out because we know we've been traveling too fast. So the other day, traffic officer pulls Mark over, and Mark has a fright of his life. He panics, and, and, and so, you know, he's, he's never been pulled over. And, and so he rolls down his window, and, and he's so apologetic, and he's saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just, I wasn't concentrating, you know. I was actually busy thinking how much I love traffic officers. <laughs> Come on, you know. And so you can imagine the traffic officer listens to that, and he's pretty impressed. And he says to Mark, he says, I must say, I've never heard that. I know you're talking about the nonsense, but, but that was original. And so he says to Mark, he says, I'm going to let you go. What's that? That's mercy. He's guilty. He should get a fine because he was speeding as he normally does. And so he should be getting a fine, but he doesn't. That's mercy. Now, let's imagine quickly for a moment. The traffic officer says to him, he says, he says, you know what? That, that's original. It's just lame, it's lame, but it's original. And he says, you know, you seem like quite a nice boy, quite a nice boy. And um, of all the people I've pulled over today, you've definitely been the friendliest and, and the most respectful. And so, you know, I, I really, I don't want to give you a fine, but I have to give you a fine. I'm sorry, I have to. And Mark is like, what? You know, I mean, here he has good intentions, but his actions aren't good. We don't need his intentions 
to be good. We need his actions to be good. Not his, his attitude, his, his actions. And so being merciful doesn't mean that we feel sorry for somebody. Or we feel compassion. Or we feel moved. No. We feel enough compassion that it moves us to do something. So in other words, it's not just an attitude. It's an action. Mercy means that we do something for somebody else. So let's bring this home to us. You may have somebody in your life who's hurt you or cheated you or deceived you or lied about you. And, and I want to say to you, you, you get that picture in your, in your mind, you know exactly whom I'm talking about? <laughs> Show mercy toward them. Oh, but Leonard, they don't deserve it. I know, I know. Show mercy. But, but, but I don't feel like it. I, I know. We normally don't. Show mercy toward them. You see, because the Bible says if we give mercy, we're going to get mercy down the line. If we sow mercy, we're going to reap it down the line. I, I don't know about you, but I make sure that I sow mercy because I know I'm going to need it down the line. So, Leonard, how are you so sure? How do you know you're going to need mercy? Oh, I know it. I know it. Because I've got a, a human nature. And believe it or not, I'm not a goody to shoes kind of guy at all. I'm going to need mercy. And so I'm sowing mercy. That's number five. So let's have a look at number six quickly. It's walk in purity. Walk in purity. Verse eight says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now, why is this such a big deal? Purity. Well, you see, people see what we do, and they hear what we say. But God sees what we think. So in other words, God sees our, our heart. And it's the heart that shows who we really are on the inside. You see, the heart is, is who we are. Listen to what the Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16. It says, the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him to strengthen those, to help those, to come alongside of, of those whose hearts are pure. Not, not whose actions, whose words, whose intentions, but whose hearts. God is looking at the heart. Do you see how important our hearts are? Because the heart is who we really are deep down on the inside. Now, our heart also reveals our motives, what we do is not nearly as important as why we do something. And so we may be doing the right thing, but if we don't do it with the right motive, if our motive is wrong, slightly twisted, we're not going to be blessed for it. Our motives are extremely important. Listen to what Proverbs 21 says. It says, mixed motives twist life into tangles. Pure motives take you straight down the road. And so when God looks at your heart and my heart, He looks into our hearts and He can see exactly what's happening there. He can see whether it's pure or not, whether our motives are good, our intentions, whether there's integrity. When God sees it's good, that's when God comes alongside of us and God helps us, where God blesses us. That's why that verse says, blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. What does that mean? They're going to see God work in their lives. They're going to see God move in their lives. They, they're going to see more of God in and through their lives. You know, it's interesting. Jesus often spoke about the, the Pharisees, and, and he didn't like them at all. Because, because really they were such a pretentious group of people. And so they often did the right things, but they generally did it for the wrong reason. And so you would find that going to the temple, but not really because they wanted to worship, just because they wanted to be seen and, and they wanted to impress other people. You'd find they would go and stand outside 
and go and pray in public these long, lengthy, fancy prayers and everything. Not because it was from their heart or they were sincere or anything. Again, just because they wanted to show off. They would help the poor. Not because they really cared for the poor. But again, because they wanted to impress the people around about them. And so you find with them, they were doing the right things. But they weren't doing it for the right reason. And that's why Jesus didn't have much time for them. You see, friends, having the the wrong motive on the inside is sometimes such a subtle thing that we don't even realize it. it. It's not obvious. It's not obvious like having a sore on your body where you can see it and feel it. and it, It's more like having a cancer on the inside. It, it's deep in there. But the problem is it'll eat you up. It'll destroy you from the inside. That's what the wrong motives do. Impure and impure heart. And so how do we deal with that? How do we make sure that our motives are right? Well, Scripture is very clear. Scripture simply says each man has got to check his own heart, has got to examine his own heart. Listen to what it says in Psalm 4. It says, in your anger, do not sin. When you are on your beds, in other words, you go to bed at night where you get quiet and you lie there and it's just you and God, you and your thoughts. It says, when you're on your beds, search your heart. And be silent. I love that part. Search your heart and be silent. So in other words, don't come up with excuses. Yeah, but, you know, and just be silent. Search your own heart. That's what scripture tells us to do. Do you know there's three commandments in the New Testament that we've got to do for ourselves? Three things that scripture tells us to do for ourselves. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Discipline yourself unto godliness. And then number three is examine yourself. Humble yourself, discipline yourself, and examine yourself. Those three things God's not going to do for us. We've got to do for ourselves. Listen to what it says in Galatians chapter 6. Let every person carefully scrutinize and examine and test his own conduct and his own work. Nobody knows what's happening in your heart and my heart better than ourselves and God. And nobody can correct what's in our hearts better than ourselves. And that's why Scripture tells us to examine our own hearts. That's how we make sure that our motives are right, that our hearts are pure. Let's move on quickly to number seven. So number five is is so mercy. Number six, walk in purity. And then number seven, be a peacemaker. Listen to what verse nine says. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this because we covered this two weeks ago and we spent quite a bit of time on it. But I just want to say this. I found you either lean toward being a peacemaker or you lean toward being a troublemaker. It's, it's the one or the other. So, so what is the difference? Well, you see, you'll find with a peacemaker, the moment they get into a little bit of a, a tense situation where there could be a bit of an argument, it's a little bit of a volatile situation, you'll find peacemakers lower their voice. They check their tone. You'll also find with a peacemaker, they... They think before they speak. A peacemaker also brings calm to a situation. They don't put fuel on the fire. So the moment they walk in, the moment they get involved, you'll find there's there's a calm. You'll also find with peacemakers, they don't have to be right. Remember what we said? You know, sometimes you're right and you know somebody else is wrong. And you can see it, and they can't see it. And you you know you're right. You know they're wrong. (laughs) But a peacemaker doesn't have to be right all the time. A peacemaker doesn't have to win the argument. A peacemaker wants to win that other person. And so sometimes what happens? We hold back. We, We know we're right. But it's almost like we let them think 
they right. And it doesn't mean we're wrong. It just means we're a peacemaker. And so that's important. Now, think about this. The reason Jesus came to this earth was to make peace, to bring peace between God and between mankind. So you could say he was the ultimate peacemaker. Now, when we go back to that verse in verse 9, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. You say, whoa, 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 hang on. Isn't Jesus the son of God? Absolutely. Now, why does it say we'll be called sons of God if, if we peacemakers? Because you're never more like Jesus than when you become a peacemaker. And so Jesus died as a peacemaker so that you and I can live to be peacemakers. So here's the last one. Number five was so mercy. Number six, walk in purity. Number seven, be a peacemaker. And then the last one, number eight, love your enemies. Love your enemies. Verse 10 says, blessed are those who are persecuted. Who persecutes us? You could say, it's our enemies. We're persecuted by enemies. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. So in other words, because we're different, because we live for him, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So you know what Jesus is saying here? He's saying there will be times where you do everything right, everything wrong happens to you. You love them, as Scripture tells us to do. Then they hate you. you. You try and be meek, and then they are just mean. You, you try and keep your heart pure, and then they're just wicked and, and evil. And so you're doing everything right, and everything wrong happens to you. And it's like, Lord, what's happening? You know what Jesus is saying? In verse 44, Matthew 5, 44, he says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. And by the way, he didn't tell us to do anything that he wasn't prepared to do. Because when they, when they beat him up and hung him on the cross, the first thing he said is, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so there may be people in your life, those same people who've hurt you and disappointed you and, and, and done you in and whatever it may be. Or maybe they've hurt some of, the, some of your loved ones, and, and you see them as a, as a little bit of an enemy, Jesus is saying to you and me today, love them. Maybe it's a sandpaper kind of person. You know those people who, who are constantly scratching you, where you're not itching, that kind of person? And, and Jesus is saying, love them. Just, just love them. Now, what does that love look like practically? Well, Jesus says here in Luke chapter 6, he says, love your enemies, do good, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, and pray for those who mistreat you. That's what love looks like when you do good, when you bless, when you pray for them. And then it says, if someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. You know what it's saying? Jesus is saying to us here, I want you to be different. I want you to act in the opposite spirit. And so you'll find with these eight attitudes, the beatitudes that Jesus gives us, he's basically saying to us, the world does this, but I want you to do that. He says, your, your nature leans this way. He says, but I want you to lean that way. And so he gives us these eight attitudes. And he says, if, if you'll apply these, if you will lean this way, not only is it going to make you different, he says, but you're going to be successful. You're going to be blessed. You're going you're gonna to be more fulfilled and more satisfied in your life. So let me, let me wrap it up with a question. I've shared these four points with you this morning. Which one was for you? So we have a look at them quickly on the screen. Sow mercy, 
walk in purity, be a peacemaker, or love your enemies. And I want to just leave that with you for just a moment. And I want you to identify which one is yours. And then let's come before the Lord. And let's ask Him, Father, this is, this is how you want us to live. This is the attitude you want me to adopt. Why don't you help me in this area, Lord? I'm just being open and transparent with you. This is, this is the one I need to work on. Why don't you just mention it to the Lord? You've highlighted it, and I've acknowledged it. And now, Lord, we simply come and say, Father, would you help us in this area? To grow, to become a little bit more like you every day and a little bit less like myself. In Jesus' name, amen. Bless you.